As much fun as it is to watch kids begin to process the world in which they live, I must admit there's one age that drives me up a wall. Yep, two-year-olds. I love them. But sometimes I just have to wonder what goes on in their little heads. I know they're thinking because they ask some really deep questions. Do ducks have knees, Grandpa? Why don't fish sink? Chapter 9 takes us into the worldly kingdom of learning, knowing, school, and education. The underlying objective of this chapter is to take a closer look at the role faith plays in getting us through this life and into our future home in heaven. Before we get started, let's first spend a few minutes to consider the kinds of knowledge that we humans normally need just to navigate our earthly kingdoms. Create a short list of the ways that people acquire knowledge. Generate a list of basic knowledge that everyone must have just to survive in this world. I'm curious. In the second list, did you consider faith? Everyone has faith in something or someone, even unbelievers. I'm curious, did you include the knowledge that Jesus is your Savior on that list? We definitely need faith in Jesus to get into heaven, but don't we also need to trust God and His promises just to get through this life? We need to believe Him when He says, I'm always with you. I hear all your prayers and act on them in your best interest. I will keep on blessing you, and I forgive you for the sake of my son Jesus. Consider how each of the following texts contribute to our understanding that the knowledge that Jesus is our Savior is a prized spiritual blessing that God wants us to have right now for this life. Read Romans 10, 17, Acts 2, 38, and Matthew 26, 26 to 28 to learn how faith is acquired and kept alive. Faith is not acquired in the same way that other knowledge is acquired. It is a gift from our gracious God, and it comes to us without any effort on our part, no paybacks, contractual agreements, endorsements. In fact, faith is ours for the taking, in spite of our natural resistance to it. It's ours by the divine power of God's Holy Spirit, who miraculously uses God's Word and the sacraments to transform people whose hearts were dead to God into living hearts that beat to the rhythms of God's own will. The writer of an open letter to the first century Hebrew Christians collected the names of many Old Testament believers whose faith in God's promises served as a model for New Testament believers. This collection can be found in Hebrews 11. Read the true story of Abraham's faith in action in verses 8 through 16. Then consider two questions. Hebrews 11, 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, 
and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What barriers or obstacles in life did your faith in God's promises help you overcome? What long-term goal will be yours because of your faith in God's promises? God's people often see themselves as having one foot firmly planted in this earthly kingdom of time, space, and change, and the other foot anchored in the spiritual soil of eternity. With that kind of certainty, death is not a morbid specter looming in my future. It is instead the door to a dream that is finally becoming my eternal reality. St. Paul had a unique way of describing this two-kingdom view of the Christian's life. He called it our now and then perspective. As we read 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12 together, it's okay to imagine yourself with one foot in this life and your other foot already in heaven. We know very little about God's heavenly kingdom because our reality is limited to this earthly kingdom. With that distinction in mind, let's read St. Paul's now and then worldview of, of a believer's faith life. Again, you can find it in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. What new insights do we learn about heaven when St. Paul writes, Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Why will these things be a thing of the past? What do you think St. Paul meant when he said, Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Keeping one eye on the then of eternity and the other eye on the now of a growing family or a struggling business, it's not easy. Yet God uses our now and then lens of faith to keep hope in our eternal future alive. One of the most beautiful of all the gospel gems in Scripture comes at the very end of St. Paul's now and then passage in 1 Corinthians. It is the comforting truth that then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Paul is here referring to that simple fact that your Lord knows you personally. His sacrifice was personally offered for you and me. Knowing God is huge. It's what gets us into heaven. But being known and being loved by God is even better because that's what we can look forward to for the rest of eternity. Why is being known by God such a beautiful and comforting thought? Read 1 John 2, 
15 through 17. How can we evaluate our own hearts to find out if we love this world more than we love God? In your prayers, ask God to help you lead the members of your family to keep this world in the proper perspective so that everyone can love the amazing wonder of belonging to God's eternal kingdom.